Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, most human interaction with computers was done through what are called terminals. A terminal device is a piece of hardware that combines a keyboard with some kind of character display, which in the early days in the 1960s was usually some kind of printer that would print out characters line by line, uh, or later in the 1970s it was usually a video console, but the video console was not capable of displaying arbitrary graphics, it could only display text characters. And these text characters could only be displayed in a fixed grid, so you wouldn't have arbitrarily positioned characters anywhere on screen. And also these devices usually only had one display font and one display color. So the idea of a terminal is that when we hook it up to a computer, the computer can then send text characters in sequence to the terminal, which get displayed character by character on the screen. And when the user sitting at the keyboard types anything, a character is sent from the terminal to the computer. So there's a neat symmetry there. A strict sequence of characters flows from the computer to the terminal and vice versa. As you can probably guess, the text going in both directions was almost always ASCII text. In Unix systems, a process may communicate with a terminal through a file representing that terminal, a terminal character device file. When a process writes to a terminal character device file, that's putting data in the output buffer of the device file, which then is going to get sent out by the operating system to the terminal device associated with that character device file. Conversely, when the user at the keyboard types something, that data gets sent from the terminal to the computer and then the operating system will take that data and put it in the input buffer of the associated character device file. And then the process then may read from the character device file to get that data. So again, be clear that the terminal is a totally dumb device. When you see text displayed on the terminal, that's something that's coming from processes running on the attached computer. The only exception to this is that with a terminal character device file, we can turn on a mode called echoing. When a terminal character device operates in the echoing mode, then any input it receives from the terminal, it will then immediately echo back out to the terminal so that it gets displayed on screen. In practice, what this means is that when echoing is on and the user types something on the keyboard, then whatever key they type, they will then immediately see appear on their screen. Just be clear that the terminal doesn't have an echoing mode. It's the terminal character device file that has an echoing mode. So the data is actually being sent from the terminal and then immediately back to the terminal. As the years went on, some terminals began to add more features. Like for example, some terminals uh, featured the ability to change text color. The way this would work is that you would set the terminal's mode, like say what color it's printing, by sending it an escape sequence, that is, a sequence of characters beginning with the ASCII escape character, which is ASCII code 27. By sending escape sequences to the terminal, we can set its modes and thereby change its behavior, like say, what color of text gets displayed, or maybe say, how many lines of text get displayed on the screen, things like that. Now the trouble with this arrangement is that early on the escape sequences weren't really standardized. Every manufacturer did their own thing. So what you would need to do to control one terminal differed from what you would do to control another. In time though, eventually a standard did more or less emerge. Unfortunately, the end result of this process ended up quite messy. So if you look into the details of terminals and want to know exactly what you can do with escape codes, it's all surprisingly complicated, so that's a whole area we're going to elide over. We'll just think of terminals as simply displaying a sequence of text and sending back to the computer whatever gets typed at the keyboard. End of story. However, I do mention these capabilities because you will likely interact with some programs that when they do use a terminal, they seem to do things that otherwise aren't possible, like say changing the color of the text. In Unix, we have this convention whereby processes, when they are started, expect to inherit from their parent two open file descriptors, 0 and 1. File descriptor 0 we call standard in, abbreviated as STDIN, and file descriptor 1 we call standard out, abbreviated as STD out. In the usual case, processes expect standard in to be a file descriptor open for reading a terminal character device file, and standard out is expected to be open for writing that same terminal character device file. In practice, what this means is that when a program wishes to read input from a terminal, it reads from standard in, its file descriptor zero, 
And when a program wishes to display text on that same terminal, it writes data to its standard out. Now be clear, this is what processes expect to inherit from their parent. Recall that when a process forks in Unix, the file descriptors from the parent get copied to the child, so it has all of the same open file descriptors. So the convention in Unix is that when programs wish to interact with a terminal, they usually don't locate an appropriate terminal themselves, they just expect to inherit these file descriptors already open to an appropriate terminal. Now, you may be wondering, why do we have two separate file descriptors, one for reading, one for writing? Well, first off, something I didn't explicitly mention in the coverage of Unix system calls is that when you open a file, you can open it in a mode such that only reading is allowed or only writing is allowed. That is possible. Still, that doesn't explain why we have two separate file descriptors when we could just get away with one for both reading and writing. This is something that will be explained a bit later when we talk about what's called redirection. Something else you may be wondering about at this point is, hey, my computer doesn't have a terminal. I have a proper monitor that's a full graphical display, and on that display I have a graphical user interface, which I interact with through a mouse and keyboard, but those are totally separate devices. I don't have a keyboard bundled together with a monitor as a single unit called a terminal. So what the hell is going on here? We don't seem to have any terminal in a modern system. The answer is that while hardware terminals are a thing of the past, what we do today is we imitate them, we emulate them in software. We have what are called terminal emulators. This window here, for example, is a terminal emulator program. To explain what's going on here, we actually first have to talk about the graphical user interface in Linux in general. In Microsoft Windows, the graphical user interface is a part of the operating system itself. It's tangled up with all the other operating system code. In Unix systems, in contrast, including in today's Linux, the graphical user interface runs basically as an ordinary program. It's not a component of the Linux kernel at all, in fact. When running a graphical environment in Linux, the program which controls your screen and which gets the input directly from the mouse and the keyboard is called an X window system server. When you then run a program which has a graphical interface, like say the Firefox web browser or the GIMP image editing program, these programs send the content of their windows to the X window server, and then the X window server is responsible for actually displaying those windows on the screen. When a user then say clicks on one of these windows, that mouse data is read by the X window server, which then sends it on to the appropriate program. Usually in this setup, we also have programs running responsible for, say, drawing all of the interface elements of the desktop, like, say, the desktop wallpaper and all the icons on the desktop, and also whatever interface elements you have for task switching and starting new programs. One program commonly used for that purpose is a program called GNOME Panel, which is part of the whole GNOME desktop, which is a whole collection of programs and libraries for creating a graphical user environment on Linux. And then additionally, with an X window server, you need what's called a window manager, which is a program which is responsible for drawing the borders around windows and also keeping track of the positions of the windows on screen and, and moving them around and resizing them and such. The window manager included with the GNOME desktop is called Metacity. So notice that GNOME panel and the Metacity window manager are both otherwise ordinary processes that talk to the X window server. So they actually talk to the X window server using the same X protocol that all other programs like Firefox and GIMP use. Be clear that the X window system is defined really by a protocol, the X protocol. And there are a few different X window servers available. The most widely one used though is called Xorg. If you have a Linux system today, most likely it's using Xorg. Also be clear that though we call it a server, the X window server is usually talking to programs running on the very same machine. So when I run Firefox on my system and I see it displayed on my screen, then it's, it's connected to the X window server running on my same system. Part of the reason though for this client server architecture is that it is possible to run a program like Firefox and have it talk to an X window server running on a different system. So if we run, say, Firefox on your system, but have it connect to the X window server running on my system, then I will be seeing that Firefox window displayed on my screen and I can interact with it, 
just like it were a program running locally on my system, but in fact it's actually running on your system. This is an example of a feature called network transparency, and the idea going back say 30 years ago when the system was first devised is that we would have a bunch of what are called thin clients, computers which don't have to be very powerful, yet simply just display programs that are actually being run on other systems. It's an arrangement actually very much like the idea with having a bunch of terminals all connected to one system where all the code is really running on that computer system and the terminals themselves can be very thin clients. They, they don't have to have much smarts in them. So now getting back to terminals, a terminal emulator is a program which sends window content to an X window server to display on screen as a graphical window and it also receives textual input from the keyboard and also perhaps mouse clicks from the X window server. The question now is how do we get other programs to read and write from the terminal emulator as if it were just like a regular terminal, an actual terminal character device file? Well, the way this is achieved is with another mechanism introduced in Unix systems called pseudo terminal device files. These pseudo terminal files are actually called in pairs, one the slave, one the master. And the program which is imitating a terminal, it reads and writes from the master, and the program which actually wishes to use this fake terminal reads and writes from the slave. So for example, I open up my terminal emulator in X Windows, and then I click in the window and say start to type something. That text data I type is sent from the X Window server to the terminal emulator, which then writes it to the master uh, ter pseudo terminal character device file. The operating system then copies that data over into the associated slave to be read by a process. So be clear that pseudo terminals are in a sense a fiction. They represent terminal devices which don't actually exist. In fact, it is the responsibility of the terminal emulator when it starts to ask the operating system to allocate a new pseudo terminal just for its own purposes. You generally want each terminal emulator to have its own unique pseudo terminal master slave pair. In the context of Linux, you'll hear talk about a feature called virtual consoles. On a Linux system, if you hold down Ctrl and Alt and hit F1 or F2 or F3, F4 up through F8, it'll switch you to another virtual console. So the X window system by default actually runs as usually the sixth, seventh or eighth virtual console. And so you switch to your X window server by holding down Ctrl Alt and hitting F7 or sometimes F8. If you hold down Control alt and hit F1, that switches you to a different virtual console, one without an X window server, but rather just a terminal. So a virtual console sort of acts like a terminal emulator. It's just that it's implemented inside the Linux kernel itself. And though these virtual consoles by default simply run with a terminal command line, you can, in a virtual console, launch an X window server, and th thereby turning that virtual console into a proper GUI desktop. So what typically happens in most Linux systems is upon boot up, it launches an X window server in one of the virtual consoles and then switches to that virtual console. So the purpose of the system is it's the way Linux gives us a terminal even if we don't have an X window server. And also it allows us to, in case something goes wrong with our X window server, we can just switch over to another virtual console and use the command line there. Assuming you have an X window server in which nothing ever goes wrong, you probably don't ever need to use virtual consoles, but it's there as a nice fallback feature, basically. Just remember, though, if you accidentally, for whatever reason, switch away from your X window server because you hit Control Alt and say like F3, just remember you can get back by hitting Control Alt and F7 or sometimes F8 or F6. It depends on your Linux distribution. The last thing to say about terminals here is where you will find the character device files. This is something that may vary depending upon which, which Unix you're using and if you're using Linux, which distribution. But on my Ubuntu system, for example, if I look in slash dev, I will see a directory called PTS, which stands for pseudo terminal slaves. And in this directory, I find all of the pseudo terminal slaves that are currently being used. And then in the dev directory itself, you'll find a file called TTY. This is a special kind of special file. It doesn't represent a character device when a program opens the slash dev slash tty file, what they get back is a file descriptor for the so-called controlling terminal. That is the terminal that is associated with their process, which is a concept we'll talk more about uh, later on. 
But the point here is that when you open this file, there's some special magic going on where what you get back for a file descriptor depends upon which process is opening the file. And finally, also in slash dev, you will see a number of files starting with TTY and then a number. These are character device files representing the virtual consoles. And again, remember that virtual consoles are a Linux specific feature. But in any case, if say you open and write to slash dev slash TTY1, what you're doing is you are writing to the terminal of the first virtual console. I believe actually these virtual consoles are numbered starting from one rather than zero. If you're wondering what TTY stand for, well, that's a historical anachronism. Back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had these devices called teletype machines. That is, uh, over a communication line, you'd have two devices on either end. You type on one end, and the character is printed out on the other end. So these were actually predecessors to hardware terminals. And for whatever reason, that's the name that the creators of Unix went with, even though it didn't really even make sense at the time, and certainly doesn't make sense as a given name 40 years later. But that's what we're stuck with. When people talk about TTYs, they're talking about terminals. You should be absolutely clear at this point that a terminal is just a dumb device for displaying text characters on the screen and for sending text characters from a keyboard to a program that wishes to read them. Without programs reading from a terminal and writing to it, terminals are pointless. What we call a shell in Unix is a program which reads from a terminal and then interprets what the user entered as a command and executes that command. Effectively, a shell is an interpreter for a programming language. It's just that the expectation with a shell is that there's a user typing the lines of code one by one, and each time they enter a line of code, the shell then immediately executes it. So we can say a shell is like an interactive programming language. The user types a command, and then the shell immediately executes that command. For many years, the most widely used shell on Unix systems was known just as SH for shell, but more formally it was known as the Born shell because it was created by a guy named Stephen Born. For the most part, all the other shells that have been widely used at one point or another that I list here are really just variations on this original Born shell. Most of them take the core of the Born shell and just extend it with additional features. Perhaps the one exception here is the C shell, which changes a few things about the syntax of the original Born shell, as well as adding additional features. The Corn shell, for example, so-called because it was created by a guy named David Corn, was created a few years after the Born shell, and it mostly adds things rather than changing anything about the core shell syntax and features. Of all the shells listed here, the one you need to become most familiar with, and the one we're going to focus on, is Bash, aka the Born Again shell. Bash was created in the late 80s by the GNU project, and so it got adapted as the as effectively the default shell in Linux systems. So in fact, most of the time when you open up a terminal window on a Linux system, it will most likely by default have the Bash shell running in it. Again, the Bash shell is pretty much just an extension of the original Born shell. I don't believe there's actually anything that they changed about the original shell, they just added more features. So say I boot up my Ubuntu system and the X window server then starts and finally my whole graphical desktop there is loaded and ready to go. If I then open the terminal program, I'll get this terminal emulator window and in it is running the bash shell because that's the default on Ubuntu systems. And as you see here, what I'm presented with is first a prompt and the prompt uh, displays my username followed by the name of the system, which here just happens to be Ubuntu, I suppose. That's then followed by a colon, after which is listed the path of the current working directory of the shell. Recall that every process in Unix has associated with it a current working directory, or sometimes called the process working directory. In this case, it is listed as a tilde, because in the bash syntax and shell syntax, tilde is used as a special signifier, as a special shorthand for my home directory. So really, what should be printed here is slash home slash Brian, and this is just shorthand. We'll talk more about the special meaning of tilde a bit later. And in any case, so after the listing of the current working directory, there's a dollar sign which simply denotes the end of the prompt. And then after the prompt, there's a space and my text cursor, where if I start typing, that's where my text is going to start appearing. Because when the shell is waiting for you to enter command, it puts the terminal into echoing mode. 
So now I can type my command and as I type it, the characters will appear in the terminal. And once I hit enter, the shell usually interprets the new line character as the end of a command. And so it will then interpret that command and execute it. Before getting into the details of bash syntax and semantics, I'll just remark here that shell languages have what I like to call a command based syntax and semantics in contrast to the expression based syntax and semantics we've seen in languages like JavaScript and Python. This stems from a very different design goal. Shells are mainly about not writing a whole bunch of code that runs within the shell, but writing code that simply launches other programs. So while it's perfectly possible in say Python to launch other programs, it's not made especially convenient because Python is mainly about writing code to run directly in the Python interpreter, not to run as separate processes. Whereas in a shell, mainly what we're about is running other programs. So this difference of purpose is what explains the reasoning behind the syntax for the most basic kind of command, what I call a process command. A process command is written by specifying the name of a program and then after one or more spaces, we then put a list of arguments. And the arguments, as we'll see, are not separated by commas, they're just separated by spaces. So for example, a process command might read ls space hyphen la space bin. And what this is, is first the program name ls, followed by two arguments, the first hyphen la, the second bin. What's going on with these arguments we'll talk about in a moment, but looking first at the program name, if this is the name of some program, some executable file somewhere on the system, how does the shell know where to find it? Well, actually there are three different cases. When you see a program name with no slashes in it, then the shell will search for an executable file of that name in one of the directories listed in what's called the path. The path is simply an environment variable in the shell process. So for example, this is what the path variable looks like in the shell on my system. It has a list of directories separated by colons. First slash user slash local slash sbin, then slash user slash local slash bin, then slash user slash sbin, and slash user slash bin, and slash sbin, and slash bin. Those are all the directories that are in my path. So in my shell, when I run the command foo, the shell will first look for a executable called foo in each one of these directories, starting with the one that's listed first and going left to right. And it goes with the first match that it finds. Assuming it doesn't find any match, then the shell reports an error, saying there's no such program called foo. So that's the first case, when I don't have any slashes in the name of the program. When the name starts with a slash, then the shell interprets this as an absolute path to an executable file. So in this case, slash bin slash foo, the shell will look for that file. And if there isn't actually a program of that name, then the shell reports the error saying, hey, there is no such program as slash bin slash foo. The last possibility is that there's a slash in the name, but not at the start. This is interpreted by the shell as a relative path name. So it will look for that path relative from the process working directory, the current working directory of the shell itself. And this is one reason why the shell will display the current working directory, because it's something you often need to know. So for example, assuming that the process working directory of the shell is currently my home directory slash home slash Brian, this will look for the file slash home slash Brian slash bin slash foo. And of course, if there is no such executable file, then the shell will give you an error message. One thing that almost always trips up newbies is they expect the shell to, when they type say foo, to look for foo in the current working directory rather than just in the directories of the path. But this is not the case. As just explained, the shell only looks in the current working directory when there is a slash somewhere in the middle of the name. The trick then to run foo in the current working directory is not to write just foo, but to write dot slash foo. What's going on here is that in a Unix system, every directory always contains an entry called dot, which refers to that directory itself. This is a special entry that's added to every directory that we create. So when we write dot slash foo, that's a relative path that's equivalent to just foo. It's just in this case, we've now tricked the shell to looking in the process working directory, whereas before it would only look in the path. While we're at it, I'll mention that Unix directories also always contain a directory entry called dot dot, which resolves to the containing directory. 
So for example, a path that reads slash home slash Brian slash dot dot, that actually resolves to the same thing as slash home. Like the dot entry, the dot dot entry in every directory is sometimes useful when we write relative path names. In any case, getting back to our example process command that begins ls, you can see that the program name here has no slashes in it, so the shell is going to look for this in the path. The motivation behind the path mechanism is that there are a number of programs on any Unix system that we want the convenience of being able to run without having to switch into their directories or having to write out their full path names. So we place these programs in a number of standard directories like say slash bin or slash sbin, or alternatively, we add the directory in which they are contained to our path. That way we can execute them without having to write out their full names. In this case, ls is a standard Unix program, sometimes called the list program, because what it does is it lists the contents of a directory. It prints out on your terminal, prints out the contents of some directory. And on most Unix systems, ls is going to be found in the slash bin directory, because slash bin is a standard directory for general programs, general common programs. The slash s bin directory is so named because it's for programs with super user privileges hence s. And so you place in there programs which do things that have to do with system administration generally. As for these other directories on the path, these slash user directories, uh, we'll talk more about the standard uh, directory layout in Unix systems in a supplement or possibly in a later unit. In any case, that explains how a shell locates a program. But what about these arguments and how exactly does the shell then execute the program? Well, anytime in Unix you have a program executing another program, what that's going to involve is first a fork system call, and then the child process that gets created invokes exec to actually load that program and run it. So first off, the shell invokes the fork system call, and then after the fork, the parent process invokes the wait system call to wait for the child process to complete. The child process, meanwhile, then has to call exec to actually run the ls program because until it calls exec, that forked off child, remember, is just a continuation of the shell. It's running the shell code until it actually calls exec. And in this exec call, one of the arguments, of course, is the path to the ls executable file. But then also there's another argument to exec whereby we can pass in what are called the program arguments. In this case, it's two strings, the first reading hyphen la, the second a string reading bin. We haven't previously discussed program arguments, so again, looking at our model of the memory layout of a process, what the exec system call does is it copies the program arguments to somewhere in the heap of the process, and then in the first stack frame, it places the address pointing to these arguments on the heap. And also on the stack, exec places a count of the number of arguments. You might think it should leave an indicator of the size of the arguments, but it doesn't have to because these arguments always are terminated by a null byte. So as long as the program gets an address pointing to the start of the arguments and a count of how many there are, the program can correctly read all of the arguments passed to it. So now when we create an executable to run on a Unix system, we are expected to observe the convention that the stack frame is going to contain the address of arguments somewhere on the heap and also a count of the number of arguments. So for example, when the Python interpreter runs on Unix, one of the first things it does is it looks for the address and the argument count on the stack and then goes and finds the arguments and puts them into a Python list. And the way you actually access these arguments in a Python program is first you import the sys module and then in the sys module there's a member called .argv which v here standing for vector, meaning essentially list. So sys.argv is the list of arguments uh, here expressed as Python strings. And while it is the case that program arguments could be pretty much any kind of data you want, either text data or binary data or whatever, we conventionally just think of them as ASCII strings. So when we invoked ls with two arguments, the first argument was an ASCII string reading hyphen la, and the second was an ASCII string reading bin. Finally, last thing to say about program arguments is that what they mean is entirely up to the program to which we pass them. In this particular case, ls interprets hyphen la as an option of how to display the contents of the directory 
And the second argument here, BIN, that's interpreted as the name of the directory whose contents we wish to list. Nothing about the shell, however, governs this. It's entirely up to the LS program itself, how it wishes to interpret its arguments. So I have to actually go and read the manual for the LS program. As you'll see, most command line programs on Unix follow a number of conventions in how to pass arguments to them. For example, the usual convention is that arguments beginning with a hyphen uh, specify some kind of option. They're usually called flags. So dash LA here is a flag to the LS program specifying some option. But again, that's just a convention. So really, you have to just break down and read the manual for any program you wish to use on the command line. In bash syntax, certain characters are given special meaning, and eventually we'll enumerate all of these special meanings. In some contexts, you'll want to disable the special meaning so that a special character doesn't signify something special, it just signifies itself. And for this purpose, we do what's called quoting. First off, to quote a single character, you simply proceed it with a single backslash, and that character combination, a backslash followed by a special character, simply designates the special character itself without any special meaning. Alternatively, you can use a pair of single quote marks, which will quote every character enclosed within. So effectively, every character between single quote marks signifies simply itself. Similarly, you can use double quote marks to quote characters, except they do not quote any enclosed dollar signs, back ticks, backslashes, exclamation marks, asterisks, or at signs. To understand how you might use quoting, consider the ls command we saw previously. In the top example here, when we proceed the space with a backslash, we are removing the special meaning that space normally has, which is to separate arguments. So effectively now what this command will do is we're invoking the ls program, but now we're only passing to it one argument, a string that reads hyphen la space bin. In the second example here, when we enclose the arguments in a pair of single quotes, that backslash now no longer has a special meaning. So this is invoking the ls program with a single argument that reads hyphen la backslash space bin. In the third example here, the backslash is now preceding a new line character, thereby robbing the new line of its normal significance, which is to denote the end of the command. So effectively what we've done is actually split this command from one line into two. So you'll actually see this trick a lot in shell scripts, you'll see lines that have been split from one line onto multiple lines by simply ending all of them with a backslash. In the fourth example, a backslash is preceding the dollar sign, so the dollar sign, which normally is a meta character, has now been quoted and therefore has no special significance. The backslash and dollar sign together signify a single dollar sign character, which is not given special treatment by the shell, it's simply passed as part of the argument to foo. In this last example, however, we're using double quote marks, and inside double quote marks, the dollar sign is one of the special exceptions. It's one of the special characters which retains its special meaning, so it's still a meta character here. What significance exactly the dollar sign has is something we'll get to later. Recall that by convention in Unix, processes expect to inherit two standard open file descriptors. File descriptor 0, which we call standard in, for reading from a terminal, and file descriptor 1, called standard out, for writing to that same terminal. Your shell is no exception, so it should both have standard in and standard out. This means then when our shell spawns off other processes, when you run a command, then those commands expect to inherit standard in and standard out. However, while processes normally expect standard in and standard out to be open to a terminal, it is sometimes useful to give a process something other than a terminal for its standard in or standard out, and this is called redirection. Assuming you start with a program like the shell that has its standard in and standard out open to a terminal and to the same terminal, well, if that program is then going to spawn off another program by forking itself and then in the fork executing the new program, well, after the fork but before the exec, it should close either standard in or standard out or both, and then open one or two other files, which will then take over the file descriptor 0 and 1, because when you open a file in Unix, it's going to use the first available file descriptor number. So if you close, say, file descriptor 0, standard in, and then open another file immediately after, you know that it's going to be open on file descriptor 0. So what redirection allows is that when the shell spawns off another program, 
that on the program, maybe it's standard in is still reading from the terminal, but it's standard out is writing to some other file, or vice versa, maybe it's still writing to that terminal, but reading its standard input from some other file, or alternatively, maybe it's standard in and standard out have both been redirected to some other file, or finally, maybe the standard in and standard out have both been redirected, but to separate files. So to give a very simple example of how this might be useful, say we have a program which normally prints some information on the terminal, that is, it writes to standard out. Well, if we redirect standard out, then the program will, instead of printing to the terminal, will print to some other file. It'll write the data to some other file, which, you know, might be useful because maybe you don't want to read the data right then, you want to preserve it in a file and read it later, or something along those lines. Whatever your purpose, we can redirect standard in and or standard output with any command in the shell using the special characters the less than sign and the greater than sign. If in a command you see an unquoted less than sign, that less than sign should be then followed by a file path. And what this tells the shell to do is to redirect standard input by closing file descriptor zero and then immediately after opening the specified file for reading. Effectively then that file assumes file descriptor zero and the inheriting program is none the wiser. It reads from standard input with the assumption that it's whatever file it's supposed to be. Likewise, an unquoted greater than sign should be followed by a file path, and this tells the shell that when it execs the command to first close file descriptor one, standard output, and immediately then open the specified file for writing, so that it assumes file descriptor one. Now, these redirections can actually be specified pretty much anywhere in the command. You can put them actually even before the name of the command, though that would be an odd thing to do. I personally prefer to put them after all of the program arguments. I find it misleading and confusing if you place them anywhere else, because it seems to imply that they're somehow a kind of argument when they're not. These are not arguments to the program. They're a special trick that the shell does before it even launches the program. So here, for example, we invoke the command foo, and it has two arguments, first a string reading bar, and another string reading 3.5, and the command includes redirections both for standard in and standard out. The order in which we write them doesn't matter, but here I've placed the redirection of standard in first. So this is redirecting standard in to a file called notes.txt, and it's redirecting standard out to the file slash dev slash null which we call is a special Unix file, which when you write to the data you write just gets discarded. This should explain now why standard in and standard out are separate file descriptors. Because if we just had one file descriptor to both read and write from, then we couldn't redirect them independently. But by having separate file descriptors, we can redirect them independently. Redirection in Unix makes possible another trick called pipelining. When in the shell, we separate two commands with the pipe character, which is usually found on the same key as your backslash key. It's easy to mistake for a lowercase l, but it's not. It's a separate character. It's a, just a vertical bar. The shell will run these two commands in parallel. It will run them at the same time, and it will redirect the standard output of the first command, which in turn is read as standard input of the second command. Effectively, whatever the first command writes to standard output gets read as standard input by the second command. The reason we have to involve a pipe is because processes can't read and write from each other like files. Processes simply can't do that, so we have to put a pipe in the middle. Looking at exactly what happens here, first the shell creates a pipe to connect the two processes, and then the shell forks itself actually twice, and then the parent, the, the original shell process, waits for both of those children, it waits for both of them to complete, and then in one of the child processes, it redirects its standard output to the pipe, the newly created pipe, before it then execs the first command. Meanwhile, the other child process redirects its standard input to the pipe before it execs the second command. So again, these two commands execute in parallel, they're separate processes, and the original shell process waits for both of them to terminate before it continues on its business. When we pipe commands, we're not limited to piping just two commands together, we can pipe three or more. In the case of three commands, you'd end up with something like this, where the first command writes its standard output to a pipe, and then that pipe is read as standard input by the second command, which in turn writes its standard output to a second pipe, which is read as standard input by the third command. 
So here, when we have three commands connected by two pipes, that actually represents two pipe files. Again, be clear that all of these commands connected by pipes are run in tandem, they're run in parallel, and the shell waits for all three to finish before it continues. So moving forward, we need to be clear on terminology. What in the shell we call a pipeline refers either to just a single process executed on its own, or it refers to multiple commands separated by the pipe character and therefore executed in tandem connected by pipes. What we call a command list is one or more pipelines separated and terminated by the semicolon character, ampersand characters, and or the new line character. So most commonly when we type commands interactively in the shell, we terminate each pipeline by simply typing enter, that is inserting a new line character, and then the shell executes that pipeline. We can also write multiple pipelines, which are meant to be executed one after the other, by writing them all out separated by semicolons before hitting enter. Here, for example, we have two pipelines, the first consisting of just the command ls, and the second consisting of just the command cat. Cat is a standard Unix command, which in this case will print out the content of the notes.txt file to standard output. But in any case, what happens here is that the shell will execute the first pipeline first, wait for it to finish, and then execute the second pipeline. So LL will run and complete first before the shell executes cat. So the important thing here is the distinction between semicolon and the pipe character. Here, when we write foo bar fizz buzz separated by semicolons, that executes all these commands in sequence one before the other. If though we were to separate them all with pipes, this not only connects them together with pipes, it also runs them in tandem. If we change the middle pipe here to a semicolon, now this is two separate pipelines. Foo and bar run first, and then when they complete, the shell runs fizz and buzz. I mentioned in passing that a pipeline can be terminated with an ampersand, but the significance of that we'll discuss a bit later. Somewhat analogous to the way functions return values, every command in the shell returns what's called an exit status, or sometimes exit code. The exit status is always an integer, and by convention, the value 0 is used to denote that the command completed successfully without error, while any value other than 0, by convention, indicates some kind of error. What that error is, exactly, depends upon the particular program. So if you run a program and get back a non-zero exit status, you should go and look in that program's documentation to figure out what it's supposed to mean. You may be wondering where command's exit status comes from. Well, if you recall back to our discussion of system calls, there was a system call called exit to which we would pass a number. That number we pass to the exit system call is the exit status returned by the program. When a parent process invokes the wait system call to wait for one of its children, what wait returns is the exit status from that child. So it's the shell which collects the exit statuses of any commands you run. So the question now is, for me, the user of the shell, what can I do with these exit statuses? Well, one thing we might do is connect two pipelines with a pair of ampersands or a pair of pipe symbols. With the pair of ampersands, the shell will first run pipeline A, and then if the last command of A returns the exit status 0, then the shell will run pipeline B. Otherwise, if the last command of pipeline A returns something other than 0, then the shell will not run pipeline B, it will get skipped over. So the execution of pipeline B here effectively becomes conditional upon the successful execution of pipeline A. The double pipe connector works exactly the same, except it inverts the logic, such that pipeline B will only run if the last command of pipeline A only returns something other than zero. If instead it returns zero, then pipeline B gets skipped over, it doesn't get executed. So here, for example, foo is executed, and if its exit status is zero, then bar is executed, otherwise it's skipped over. Then, whether or not bar ran or not, the fizz command is executed, because it's separated by a semicolon. The, the semicolon here has a lower precedence than either the double ampersand or the double pipe. So you can sort of think of it as if there are parentheses around the first two commands here and the second two commands. Though I don't mean that in a literal sense, because we don't use parentheses exactly like that in the shell. They don't group commands in the same way as you group expressions. But in any case, so the fizz command here will run, and if it returns something other than zero, then the buzz command will return. Otherwise, if fizz does return zero, then buzz will not run. So the double ampersand and the double pipe, those are two ways you can utilize return codes. 
As we'll see mainly in the supplement, there are other ways of using exit statuses. So far, I've only discussed what I call process commands, commands which are actually executable programs. There's another kind of command, however, called a built-in command, which is a command implemented in the shell itself. So when we execute a built-in command, that just runs as code in the shell itself. There's no spawned off process. As we'll get into though, there's what we call a subshell, which is essentially a fork of the process. And in some cases you may end up running a built-in command that runs not in the main shell process, but possibly in a fork of the shell. Also, while these built-in commands do run in the shell, they still do allow for redirection and piping. When a built-in command is redirected, the shell doesn't actually redirect its own standard input and output, but just for the sake of that one built-in command, it will arrange things to get the same end result. Basically what happens is that every built-in command is given a duplicate of the standard in and standard out file descriptors, and then if you redirect the command for the built-in, then that duplicate for that just one built-in command is redirected, and so it doesn't affect any other commands, just that one command. How exactly this is done is, of course, an implementation detail of the shell, which you don't really need to concern yourself with. In any case, Bash has about 70 different built-in commands, and the first one we'll discuss is the help command. The help command simply prints out to standard output information on how to use the built-in commands, including the help command itself. So if at the shell you type help and hit enter, you'll get this list of all of the built-in commands, and if you want more detail on one of these commands, you simply type help space and then the name of that command and hit enter and then the help command will print out detailed information of whatever command you specify be clear that the help command only gives information on the shell's built-ins it doesn't give any information on regular unix utilities like say the ls program if you want to see documentation for standard unix utilities like ls there's a standard unix utility for that purpose called man as in manual short for manual we'll talk about how to use man in the supplement Another built-in command is cd, which is short for change directory, and what it does is it sets the current working directory, or the process working directory as it's sometimes called, of the shell process itself. And so it should be apparent why this is a built-in command and not just a standard Unix utility, why it's not a separate program, because separate processes can't modify the shell's current working directory, only the shell process itself can do that. This is an important thing to keep in mind, because in some contexts, as I mentioned, built-in commands get run not in the shell itself, but in a subshell that is a fork of the shell. So you want to make sure, if you want to change the current working directory of your main shell, you want to make sure that it runs in that actual shell process, not in a subshell thereof. If we run the cd command in a subshell, then that would be modifying the current working directory of that fork, of that subshell, not of the, the shell from which it was spawned. In any case, here's an example of using the cd command. Say, here's my prompt. Uh, I'm user Brian, logged in on the system Ubuntu with the current working directory of slash home slash Brian. And so if I enter the command cd with an argument of slash bin, then that's changing my current working directory to slash bin. And you can see this change of directory in the next prompt. If I then enter the command cd with an argument of slash, then that's changing my current working directory to the root directory to slash. And so the next prompt we get displays the current working directory as slash. An important thing to keep in mind is that when we fork processes in Unix, the fork, the child, inherits the current working directory from the parent. So any command we run from the shell inherits the current working directory of the shell itself. And this is significant because many commands will use the current working directory as a default argument for a file path when no file path argument is given. Like for example, the ls command, if we don't give it a program argument specifying a directory whose contents we wish to list, then the ls command assumes we wish to list the content of the current working directory. So in fact, if you run ls with no arguments at all, then what it will print out is the contents of the current working directory of your shell. The built-in command echo simply prints all of its arguments to standard out. So here, for example, we have echo with the arguments foo and 2, 3, 4, or 8. Then that simply just puts out to standard out the text foo and then space 2, 3, 4, 8. Now, of course, this may not seem useful at the command prompt, because why would you want the shell to just spit back at you exactly what you just typed? But one way this is useful is that in various ways we haven't yet discussed, the shell, when we use certain special syntax in the arguments, processes the arguments such that what actually gets sent to the command is different from what you literally type. For example, the dollar sign specially denotes the syntax for what's called variable expansion. 
The shell, again, is basically an interpreter. It's effectively a programming language, and like in any programming language, we have the ability to assign values to variables. The syntax for this is to simply write the name of the variable you wish to create or modify, follow it immediately with an equal sign, and then everything that follows the equal sign is considered the value being assigned to the name. Effectively, all of the text that follows the equal sign is a string, and that string is assigned to the variable. If we then wish to use the value of the variable, we can't just refer to the variable by name, because if you were to just write the name, that name as text would be the argument, not the value held in the variable. So to actually use the value of a variable in the arguments to a command, we use the dollar sign and then follow that with the name of the variable. And depending upon the context, you sometimes will need to enclose to distinguish the name of the variable you're expanding from the text that surrounds it. So here, for example, we're assigning the value 4 to a variable named foo, and be clear here that though it's a number 4, the value being assigned here is actually a string consisting of the character 4. And then if we invoke the echo command with an argument of dollar sign $foo, well, dollar sign $foo gets expanded, or replaced, we could say, with the value of the variable, which is text simply consisting of a single character, the digit 4. So what this echo command will actually print to standard out is just the digit 4, not a dollar sign, not foo. That gets replaced with the value. In the next line, we're again invoking the echo command, but now the argument is the expansion of foo followed by a letter D. And this time we have to use the form with curly braces, otherwise the shell would think we're trying to expand a variable named food, not foo and so actually it would then expand to nothing. It's actually possible to expand a variable that doesn't exist and it just expands to an empty string. So with the next two lines, it should be evident what's going on. We're simply assigning the string hello to a variable named bar and then the next line we're echoing out the content of the variable bar. So hello gets printed to standard out. You may recall earlier I mentioned there's a difference between single quotes and double quotes. When we use single quotes in the shell, what gets quoted is the text verbatim with no exceptions. Double quotes, in contrast, make a few exceptions, including the dollar sign used for variable expansion. So here when we echo dollar sign foo enclosed in double quote marks, the expansion is actually performed, and so it prints 4 to standard out, whereas if we were to enclose the same in single quotes, then what gets echoed is the verbatim text, dollar sign foo. A variable in the shell could be marked as an environment variable, which effectively means that the shell creates a matching environment variable, and then when you subsequently assign new values to your variable, the matching environment variable is given the same value. This can be useful because when we fork our shell or launch other programs from our shell, we may want those forks and other programs to inherit certain environment variables. For example, the Python interpreter expects to inherit an environment variable called python underscore path, which is a list of directories which the Python interpreter then uses to look for modules. So before we launch the Python interpreter from our shell, we want to make sure that the shell itself has an environment variable python underscore path with an appropriate value. Now by default, when you create a shell variable, it is not an environment variable. We have to mark it as such with the built-in command export. So here, for example, we create a variable foo, which we assign the value 8. And then in the next line, the export command is marking the variable foo as an environment variable. So it actually creates here a matching environment variable called foo with the current value of the shell variable. In the next line then, when we assign a new value to the shell variable, this variable is marked as an environment variable, so the matching environment variable is updated with this new value. As I've been saying, the shell really is just a kind of programming language, and so we need control flow constructs, and for that purpose then we have the built-in commands if and while. In general, these both work like their counterparts in languages like Python and JavaScript, but their precise syntax is a bit eccentric owing to the command-based nature of the shell syntax. So looking at the if command, for example, the word if itself is a built-in command of the shell, but unlike the commands we've seen so far, where the arguments are basically just a series of strings, if expects as its arguments first a command list, followed by the word then, followed by another command list, followed by the word fi, which is if spelt backwards. And the while command has the same format, except the terminators are the words do and done. 
I guess it was decided no one wants to type E-L-I-H-W. Frankly, I find the idea of using the command name reversed as a terminator quite silly. They should have just gone with done for all terminators, though I personally would have gone with end as the terminator for every if and while. Also, I should remind you here that the last command in a command list must be terminated either with a semicolon or a new line. So as you see them written here, where if and while are both portrayed as single line commands, these command lists must all be terminated by a semicolon if they're going to be on the same line. They can't just be separated by a space from then, do, fee, and done. In any case, what's going on with both of these commands is that their first command list is the condition, and then the second command list is the body that executes. So the condition command list is executed, and if its exit status is equal to zero, that is considered true, and anything other than zero is considered false. Be clear that this is actually backwards from JavaScript and Python, where zero is considered false and all other numeric values are considered true. Oh, and I'll also remind you that the exit status of a command list is the exit status of its last executed command. So if a command list does in fact consist of multiple commands, it's the last executed command whose exit status is used as the condition. Last thing to mention here is that though I do show these two commands written out as single lines, in practice, you'll usually see if and while commands written out on multiple lines, just like you would expect to see in, say, JavaScript or Python. Because these commands are only terminated by the pre-designated words fee and done, you can use new lines to separate the commands in these command lists. Like any programming language, the shell allows us to create functions, and we do so with the built-in command function. Function expects as its first argument the name of the function you are defining, followed by a pair of curly braces inside which is a command list, which is the body which gets invoked when we invoke the function. So here, for example, we define a function which we give the name foo, and then it has a body of two commands, first invoking ls, and then the built-in cd. And we should note that because the command list is delimited by curly braces, we can then actually spread the commands of the command list onto multiple lines. So we don't have to write a function all in just one line. We can write the same function like so. And because the space at the front of the line is basically ignored, we can indent it how we like. So sensibly, you would probably indent it like this. Once we've defined the function, we can then invoke it like any other command. You start the command with the name of that command, in this case, the name of the function. The question then arises, what happens with name collisions between function names and the names of built-in commands and also of regular programs, of process commands? Well, the answer is that the shell basically has an order of precedence. When it sees a command name with no slashes in it, it first assumes that that name refers to a function, but if there is no function of that name, it then checks to see if it's the name of built-in command, and finally failing that, then the shell will look in the directories of the path to see if it can find the executable of that name. So just understand that functions take precedence. If we were to define a function and called it cd, then any time we try to invoke the built-in cd command, instead we would be invoking the function which we have defined. And while we're on the subject of namespaces, I should mention that functions and variables live in separate namespaces. So if we have a variable named foo, we can also have a function named foo, and there's no interference there. They live in separate namespaces. Now, when we define a function, we don't specify any names for parameters that function expects to receive. Instead, arguments passed to a function are always assigned to the special parameter names 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. So in the body of a function, we get the first argument value with the syntax $1, and the value of the second argument with $2, and the third with $3, and so forth. So here, this function foo its body consists of two commands. First, cd with an argument of $2. That is the value of the second argument passed to foo. And then the second command here, ls, has a single argument, which is the value of the first argument to the function. So in the next line, when we invoke this function, the first argument is slash bin, and the second is slash home. So what this function will do is first change the current working directory to slash home, and then list the contents of the slash bin directory. When we invoke a function, the exit status of that invocation is normally the exit status of the last command executed within the function. With the built-in return command, however, we can explicitly return a value from a function and also cause execution to leave a function early. 
So just like in Python or JavaScript, a return statement may be encountered before the very end of the function, but when encountered, a return causes execution to leave the function. This example function does nothing except invoke the return built-in to explicitly return the value 3. Notice in this last line, however, we're using the special variable expansion $question mark, which expands into the exit status of the previously executed command. So here we invoke foo, and that returns the value 3. So in the next line, the expansion $question mark expands into the value 3. So far, we've discussed variable expansion, but there are a number of other kinds of expansion, including what's called brace expansion. An argument that uses brace expansion contains a pair of curly braces not preceded by a dollar sign, because if the dollar sign were there, this would be a variable expansion, not a brace expansion. Inside these curly braces, you have a comma-separated list, and then before the braces, you optionally have a preamble and afterwards a postscript. So consider this example, say we have an argument that reads foo curly brace apple comma banana and curly brace bar. What this expands into is foo apple bar space foo banana bar. So what happens in the brace expansion is that each item separated by commas in the curly braces that gets surrounded by the preamble and postscript and then the values produced from this expansion are separated by spaces. So the second example here has a comma separated list of 35 comma 14 comma high with a postscript of bar and notice it has no preamble. So implicitly the preamble is just an empty string. So what we end up with is three items, 35 bar, space 14 bar, space high bar. Now those are just simple examples of brace expansion. There are a few other things you can do which I won't get into. But the question is, when would this ever be useful? And the answer is that with some commands you end up writing a string of arguments that are all very similar but for small differences. And so with brace expansion, we can express that in a more convenient way. Like for example, say two of our arguments are file paths that are exactly the same, but for one change. So here we write slash user slash local slash source slash bash slash, and then in curly braces, comma separated old and new, what we end up with then are two separate arguments, both the same except for the last component of the path. Another kind of expansion is called tilde expansion. I mentioned in passing that tilde in the shell is used as a shorthand for your home directory. So what actually happens is that when the shell sees a tilde in the arguments to a command, it expands that tilde into whatever your home directory path is. So on my system, for example, my home directory is slash home slash Brian, so tilde would expand into slash home slash Brian. If I were to write an argument tilde slash foo, again the shell will expand that tilde into slash home slash Brian, so it'd end up with slash home slash Brian slash foo. The shell also has a powerful feature called command substitution. The idea here is that a command is invoked, and whatever that command writes to standard out, that data gets inserted where the command substitution is placed. And there are two syntaxes for this. The first encloses the command in a pair of parentheses preceded by a dollar sign. The second encloses a command in backticks. Backtick is the character on the same key as the tilde on American keyboards. So for example, if I write dollar sign paren echo space foo and paren, the echo command here writes foo to standard output. So that text is what gets inserted in place of this command substitution. The output gets substituted in place of the command. And alternatively here, we can get the same effect by writing the same thing except enclosing the command in backticks. The downside to this backtick form is that because it uses the same character as the start delimiter and end delimiter, that means you can't nest command substitutions with the syntax. Anytime you wish to nest command substitutions, you have to use the dollar sign paren syntax. So here, for example, we're attempting nested command substitutions, and in the top example, we're properly using the dollar sign paren syntax. So what actually happens here is first the interior command substitution command runs, echo bar, and so first bar is substituted in place of that command substitution, and then the outer command substitution is performed, invoking echo with the arguments foo and bar, so foo space bar gets inserted in place of that command substitution. When we try this with backticks, we don't get the same effect, because what's really going on here is that the first command substitution runs from the first backtick character to the second one, the second backtick preceding the second echo, 
And then at the end of this line, we have another pair of back ticks indicating a command substitution with no command inside, which effectively just returns the null string. In fact, this means that the second echo isn't really a command, it's just argument text. So what happens here is the first command substitution is the command echo with an argument foo, so the text foo gets substituted in its place, leaving us with foo echo space bar. So the lesson here again is when you do wish to do nested command substitutions, don't use the back ticks. That will end up producing a result you probably don't intend. Another useful kind of substitution is called arithmetic substitution. An arithmetic substitution is written with a dollar sign and two pairs of parens in which we place an arithmetic expression which gets evaluated and the result of that evaluation is what gets substituted as the text. So in the first example here, the arithmetic substitution has an expression 3 plus 5. The shell evaluates that and returns this text 8. In the second example, the expression first adds 3 plus 5 together, getting us 8, and then that's multiplied by 2, getting us 16, so the text returned is 1, 6. Very handily, we can do variable substitutions inside arithmetic substitutions. So here, for example, we assign the value 7 to the variable foo, and then in a subsequent arithmetic substitution, we can expand the variable foo to get its current value, which is then here added to 3, resulting in the text 1, 0. One more kind of expansion is called file name expansion. If in an argument you see the special characters asterisk or question mark, or if you see both, that argument is expanded into the matching file or directory names where the asterisk is used to match a run of zero or more characters, while the question mark is used to match a single character. So for example, if I write as argument foo asterisk bar, the shell will look in its current working directory for matches, and any file or directory which matches that pattern gets included in the expansion. So imagine, say, we have a file called foo3bar, well that matches, or foo asdf asdf bar, that also matches because the asterisk will match any number of characters. And lastly, foobar will match because the asterisk will match against the absence of any character. In the same directory, however, if you were to write foo question mark bar, that would only match against foo3bar because foo sdf sdf, that's multiple characters in between the foo and bar, and foo bar will not match because there has to be one character to match the question mark. You can't have the absence of any character. As this last example illustrates, the asterisk doesn't have to go in the middle of text, it can also go at the front or at the end. So here foo asterisk will match all the same things as foo asterisk bar, except it will also match foo ack. It effectively matches anything that begins with foo. So again, in all of these examples, the shell is searching for matching file names or directory names in the current working directory, but if we were to proceed the argument with a slash, then the shell would try and match the argument against absolute paths. So that's covered most, if not all, of the mechanisms of expansion and substitution that the shell offers. I alighted over some features that, while potentially in some cases useful, are really quite ugly in their details, and so kind of kind of a headache to think about. One last thing, though, that can be useful to know is the order in which the shell will perform these expansions and substitutions. The general order is first it does brace expansions, then it will do tilde expansions, and then third it will do, at the same level of precedence, variable expansions, arithmetic expansions, and command substitutions. So really what that means is it matters which is inside which, which is the most interior, because just like with expressions, uh, they're evaluated inside out. And then lastly, only after doing all that other stuff will the shell do file name expansions. So keeping this order in mind can help you understand commands that make a complicated use of these expansions and substitutions. Lastly, there is the question of when will the shell do expansion or substitution upon the result of my expansions or substitution. So the question is then, does the shell do a file name expansion on the result of that variable expansion? Also, you'll find there are quite complicated rules about certain contexts in which expansions and substitutions are not performed like they otherwise normally are. To be perfectly honest, I'm not totally clear on all those rules myself, and it's because of all these complications with expansions and substitutions that I consider the shell to really be quite an ugly language. In any case, if you wish to read up on this stuff, the place to look is the GNU Bash manual. I mentioned earlier that in some contexts, commands can be run in what's called a subshell, 
To illustrate, here's what happens in what we can think of as the normal case, where we have the shell and it runs a command process by simply forking itself, and while the parent process, the original shell, waits, the child process, the child shell, execs the command executable. When a command is executed in a subshell, however, the shell again forks itself per usual, but then it's the subshell which forks itself and waits while its child fork execs the actual process executable. Again, the reason why it's important to understand when this happens is because that subshell, any changes made in that process, do not affect the parent shell from which it was spawned. So say if we assign to a variable in a subshell, the change won't be seen in the shell from which it was spawned. For reasons which are at this point fairly obscure and I can't really explain here, you may wish to execute a command list in a subshell. And we can do this with what's considered an operator, a pair of parentheses. So here if I write this command list and put them in parentheses, that will execute not in the shell itself, but in a newly spawned subshell thereof. So here in this example, the first command in the parentheses is an invocation of the built-in CD. And CD, as I've explained, will change the current working directory of the shell. But because we're running in a subshell here, this will only affect that subshell, not the shell from which it was spawned. So that actually perhaps is one reason why you might wish to use these parentheses to run something in a subshell, because you want to invoke commands which will affect the shell, but you want the effects of those changes only to be seen in a limited scope. A seemingly similar syntax that uses curly braces instead of parentheses will execute a command list in the current shell rather than a subshell. The syntax for this, though, is actually quite different because the curly brace here, the begin curly brace, that's really a built-in command. The curly brace, that's just the name of the, of the built-in. Because this is a built-in and not an operator, there has to be a space after the opening curly brace and before the end curly brace, which is really just an argument to the built-in that signifies the end of the command list. You may notice that superficially this curly brace built-in resembles the curly brace syntax we see, say, in a function, but really they're actually quite separate things. They're not, they're not inherently related. When you use the function built-in and you write the curly braces for it, they're not the same thing as this built-in, even though they pretty much sort of have the same effect. In any case, you're probably wondering what the hell is the purpose of this, because if I want to write a sequence of commands, I don't have to write it as a command list like this, I can just write them one after the other. So when would I ever use this? Well, the answer here is that if you use redirection on this curly brace built-in, that will effectively redirect all of the commands in the command list. So it's simply a nice convenience when you wish to apply the same redirections to a series of commands. If you're wondering what the exit status of this curly brace built-in is, it's simply the exit status of the last command executed in the command list. Now, where subshells most commonly come into play is with the use of the ampersand terminator. If we terminate a pipeline with the ampersand rather than the semicolon or a new line, then that pipeline runs in the so-called background as opposed to the usual foreground. What it means to run in the background is that, first of all, the shell will not wait for the pipeline to complete. Secondly, it means the commands of the pipeline are run from a subshell, and it is the subshell which will wait for the commands of the pipeline. Additionally, anything running in the background should not read from the terminal from which it was spawned, because that would interfere with the continuing operation of the shell. When we start something in the background from the shell, we want it to execute while we are continued to allow using the shell. We don't want it to interfere with our use of the shell. So it shouldn't read the terminal. In some cases, you may also prefer that something running in the background shouldn't write to the terminal either, because that might interfere with your use, or at least it might just confuse you. So you may choose to redirect the standard out of a pipeline running in the background so that you don't see any of its output, but it's a matter of preference whether or not you allow something running in the background to write to your terminal. Reading from your terminal, however, that is verboten, because then it wouldn't really be running in the background. Consider an example use of the ampersand terminator, here, the foo command will be run in the background, and even before it finishes running, the shell will then invoke bar. The shell will then wait for bar, however, because bar is terminated by a semicolon, and then it will run fizz, and again wait for fizz, because it's terminated by a semicolon. But then, once fizz is completed, the shell will run buzz in the background. So, the shell will invoke buzz, but not wait for it to complete. Just like we can apply redirections to the whole of a command list in parentheses or curly braces, we can terminate these with an ampersand to run them in the background. 
And the interesting thing here is that because running in the background always involves a subshell, effectively the behavior here is precisely the same. While the curly brace command doesn't normally involve a subshell, here because it's running in the background it does. To make the foreground background distinction more useful, modern Unixes have introduced a feature called job control, which involves organizing processes first into groups called jobs, and those so-called jobs in turn get organized into what are called sessions. A process's membership in a job and a session actually is a property of the process itself, kept track of by the operating system, and there are system calls, which we didn't mention in the previous unit, for setting a process's membership in a job and a job's membership in a session. We won't go into those details because they are system calls that are used pretty much only by shells, so unless you're going to write your own shell, you won't ever have to deal with them. But the concept here of how the processes get organized into jobs and sessions is relevant if you're going to use the shell. The usual arrangement is that when we open a terminal window, and inside that terminal window you have a shell running, that shell represents the start of a new session, and that session starts out with one job containing just the shell process. When the shell then runs a pipeline in the foreground, the processes of that pipeline run as members of the existing job, the same job as the shell. Anytime though the shell creates a subshell, that subshell runs as a new separate job. So say if we run a pipeline in the background, that creates a new subshell, and all the processes of that pipeline and that subshell run in a new separate job. Now associated with a session is what's called its controlling terminal. This will be the terminal which the original shell of the process is using as standard input and output. At any moment in time, only one job in a session is running in the foreground. All other jobs are marked as running in the background. Whereas processes in the foreground job can freely read and write the controlling terminal, processes running in a background job get sent the signal sig ttin when they attempt to read the controlling terminal. So with this feature called job control that modern Unixes have, processes running in the so-called background are actually prevented from reading from standard input of the terminal. The other special thing about the foreground job is that when the user at the terminal types control z, this sends the signal sig t stp, which means terminal stop. This signal is sent to all the processes in the foreground job, and the default behavior when a process receives sig t stop is to suspend execution. What control z also does is send the signal sig cont, as in continue, to processes in a selected background job, therefore resuming them if they had been suspended, and that background job is also then moved into the foreground. So quite simply, Control-Z will suspend the foreground job and move another background job into the foreground. Usually when the user hits Control-Z at the terminal, they want to suspend whatever job is running and get back to their shell, so normally the background process that gets resumed is the one with the shell in it. To manage the jobs running in the session of our shell, we have three built-in commands. First, jobs, which will list all of the background jobs, and their job numbers, which are numbers assigned to uniquely identify each job. Then we have the bg command, as in background, which will nominally what it does is it moves a job into the background, but what it really does is it effectively resumes any job that's been suspended because it sends the sig cont to all the processes in a background job you specify by number. This is most typically useful because say we invoke a command, but then it takes too long and we want to get back to our shell, so we hit control z, that suspends whatever program was running, that puts it in a background job, but it's suspended and we want to then resume it, so we write bg and its job number too, so it can continue on in the background while we get to work with our shell. Lastly, we have the command fg, as in foreground, whose name correctly implies that it moves a job from the background to the foreground, and in the process it will also send sig cont to all the processes of that job. So with control z and these three commands, you can control the jobs running in your session. The very last thing we'll talk about in this unit are shell scripts. A shell script is a file of shell commands using the bash syntax, and the idea is we can execute this file just like we can say execute a file of JavaScript code or a file of Python code. So assuming we've written such a file, a file that consists of a list of shell commands, observing all the rules of shell syntax, if we wish to execute this file, we can do so with the built-in command source. The source command is invoked with the name of a file as argument, and what it will do is read through that file and execute the commands in the current shell. 
So what we get from this is the same effect as if we were to read through that file and manually enter at the command line each command one by one. So for example, what actually happens when we start up a new shell in a new terminal window is bash will invoke the commands in a file in your home directory called .bashrc. RC here stands for run commands. The idea of the .bashrc file is it's a place we can put any sort of customizations we want for our shell. And because this file is run every time we start a new shell, we don't have to manually enter the commands in this file each time to get our shell the way we want it. Like say, very typically in a .bashrc file, you'll see lines giving default values to certain environment variables. In any case, it's important to understand that this shell script, this .bashrc file, is run with the source command, such that all the commands in that file are executed in the shell itself, not some subshell thereof. Now, sometimes we don't want a shell script to affect our current shell. We want it to run instead in a subshell. To do this, we can simply invoke the bash interpreter as a program and pass to it as argument the name of our shell file. The bash interpreter in most Unixes will be found at the path slash bin slash bash, and so here we are starting bash and telling it to run the file foo.sh in the current working directory. Be clear that shell scripts don't have to end in .sh, but it is a common convention. To make invoking the script more convenient, we can use a bit of Unix magic called the shebang. If we start the first line of our script file with the number sign character followed by an exclamation mark, followed by the absolute path to a program, usually an interpreter, in this case, the bash interpreter, slash bin slash bash. But if we were writing a Python script, we could put slash bin slash Python. And if we're writing a Perl script, we can put slash bin slash Perl and so forth. But in any case, what the special line does is it allows us to invoke our script file, which is a text file, as if it were a binary executable. It turns out that the exec system call doesn't have to be passed a binary executable. If you pass it a text file that begins with these two special characters, these ASCII characters, exec will then execute the program specified by the file path, in this case, slash bin slash bash, and then pass the script file as argument to that program. So if we put the shebang line at the top of our file foo.sh, we can then invoke the script as if it were like an executable. We can write dot slash foo.sh, and that tells the shell to execute a file in the current working directory called foo.sh. Now actually there is one last detail here. If we're going to be executing the script file as if it's an executable, then Unix requires that we have execute permission on this file. To give the file execute permission, we use the chmod program, which is a standard Unix utility. Notice it not coincidentally has the same name as the system call, which sets permissions on files. And here, when we pass it an argument u plus x, that tells chmod to turn on execute permission for the user that owns this file, foo.sh. So having done that, assuming we're running a shell with the same user account as the owner of the foo.sh file, we can run the command dot slash foo.sh to run this script. And again, remember that in this case, we're running the script in a subshell, not the current shell. So that's everything we're going to cover in this unit about bash. But what did I not cover? Well, I only talked about a handful of built-ins, whereas in total there are about 70 of them. Nor did I mention many of the standard Unix utility programs. We mentioned ls, but that's pretty much it. There are over 100 utilities, a few dozen of which are used quite commonly, and we only talked about one or two. So if you're going to want to use the shell, you're definitely going to want to learn to use more of the Unix utilities, and also you're going to want to learn at least a handful more of the built-ins. And aside from those two major areas, there's a handful of other features that I didn't discuss. Like, for example, it's possible to have values which aren't strings, but are actually arrays. And there are other features like aliases, and there's what's called the history mechanism. And also, when I talked about substitutions and expansions, I glossed over some of the more complicated forms. Those are all what I would consider rather advanced uses of the shell, and you can probably get by for years without ever using them but they are features which you may eventually wish to look into.